Good day to everybody. It's another Daily Devotions. It is November 28th, and we finish up the Book of Romans today, chapters 14, 15, and 16. So begin, uh, in chapter 14, uh, Paul continues to address the issue of transformation that is brought about in Jesus Christ. Um, but here, Paul takes up a specific issue uh, that is causing some tension in the church. Some believers uh, strictly observe certain regulations in the Mosaic law regarding dietary matters and holy days. And we'll see this again. This, is, this becomes a point of contention uh, in the church among Jews and Gentiles. We saw a little bit of that in Acts, particularly around circumcision and um, some other behaviors. Paul refers to them here, these, these persons who observe these things, as the weak. Um, now, whether Paul is actually calling them the weak, or that is a label that those who don't observe these strict matters uh, are referring to is not for sure. Um, so um, you have some who believe that because Jesus says Messiah has come, they now have the freedom to ignore these regulations in the law. You have other Jews who become Christians who either feel like everyone should still obey them or perhaps some continue to do so uh, because that's their, that's their history. That's their heritage. You know, uh, that's the way they grew up. They didn't, they grew up not eating pork. They're not going to not start eating pork now. So just as some have the freedom to eat pork, others have the freedom to say, no, I don't want to do that. So this is causing some tension. Um, uh, so whatever, whatever has given rise to this conflict uh, at the church in Rome, Paul's response is, is theological. He begins by insisting that neither judge, neither side may judge or despise the other side because God has welcomed them. And here uh, he offers an analogy uh, he offers, uh, he basically compares believers to household servants, all our servants in God's household, and may not judge the servants of another. All give thanks to the same Lord, whatever their dietary practices might be. All live and die in the presence of the same Lord. All will be judged by the same Lord. Um, and uh, in support of this claim, uh, Paul points to Isaiah 45, 23. Um, so, um, apart from the use of this terminology of strong and weak, uh, Paul speaks of both sides in an evenly balanced way, in that Paul does not appear to favor any either party in the dispute. Um, it becomes clear that he himself agrees with the so-called strong persons who uh, do not see the need to follow these laws. Uh, nevertheless, it also becomes clear clear here that his uh, admonitions are largely intended for them rather than for the weak. So he's speaking to the strong here, the quote, the strong. Nothing is unclean in the Lord Jesus, that is to those who have already been called into life in the new age inaugurated in Jesus Christ, but it is nevertheless wrong to eat in a way that causes the weaker brothers or sisters to act against their own consciences. Now, in chapter 15, at the beginning of chapter 15, Paul explicitly identifies himself with the strong and urges that they must put up with the weak. Um, the translation here, put up with, uh, conjures, uh, conjures up uh, uh, tolerance, uh, bearing with. So uh, you put up with this. And he returns, he returns to the language of building up, acting for the good of the neighbor, right? So um, do not judge these folks. Do not give them a hard time. Build up. We build up the community together. Um, so beginning in verse 7 of chapter 15, Paul returns to the language of welcome. But this section is more than a conclusion to that specific discussion. It also brings together several of the major concerns of the letter, constituting what many have regarded as the climax of the entire argument here. Uh, the opening admonition uh, of 15.7 repeats uh, that of 14.1, welcome. Here, however, the language of strong and weak has disappeared. 
as a dispute over dietary matters and the marking of holy days gives way to different terminology. The command to welcome one another in 157 does not concern the strong and the weak, but the circumcised and the Gentiles, uh, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Each group is to welcome the other. They're to accept and respect one another's differences, just as Christ has welcomed you. In both cases, that welcome is for God's glory. This is not hospitality for its own sake or simply to enhance the social life of the divided community. This is the, at the very character of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Welcome each other. Um, so uh, Paul underscores uh, about uh, the claim about the way in which Christ has welcomed both Jew and Gentile. Uh, he offers four quotations from scriptures here uh, in verses eight and nine, Deuteronomy, from Psalms, Deuteronomy, uh, and Isaiah. And uh, Jew and Gentile together will, will offer praise to God. And Paul draws this section to an end with a prayer. It's a wish of hope. It is God's power and that of the Holy Spirit that brings about the sharing, uh, the shared praise of Jew and Gentile alike. Now, beginning in 1514, Paul closes out the letter. Um, he has not yet been to Rome, and uh, he reiterates in verse 14 his confidence about the health of the congregation, uh, the, and yet immediately he appeals to his own vocation as a reason for the letter. Uh, Paul, uh, uh, his service of the gospel, he says, concerns the offering of the Gentiles, a phrase that uh, may refer to the Gentiles themselves as, a, as an offering or to the collection itself, um, which forms such an important part of Paul's own mission uh, and is very much at the, at the uh, forefront of his thinking as he writes the letter. Paul adds uh, two remarks about his own work. He is proud of what he has accomplished, although he also immediately asserts that his boast is in what God has done. And he specifies that the geographical extent of his work reflects his goal of preaching to those who have not yet heard the gospel. Um, in verses 22 and 23, Paul reflects on his plan for future travel. As he indicated back at the beginning of the letter, he intends to travel to Rome. And now that he adds, after being in Rome, he wants to take the gospel to Spain. And it appears that Paul seeks the support of the Roman congregations for his labors in Spain. Uh, but most immediately, Paul's work takes him to Jerusalem with the collection for the poor among the saints. Uh, the collection clearly occupies an important place in Paul's mission. Although he speaks about the collection in terms of human need, it is clear that Paul also understands that this need, understands this need in theological terms. The Gentile believers in Macedonia from Jewish believers uh, and are so right to share in the material goods. And uh, this reveals Paul's deep concern that Jerusalem will reject the collection as he calls for the Romans to pray that the collection will be acceptable and that he will be rescued in Jerusalem. Apparently, Paul fears that the unity of Jew and Gentile, the unity for which he has argued throughout the letter, will be rejected in Jerusalem, and that is his concern. Now, whether Paul was able to follow through with these plans, we don't know. Luke's account of Paul's arrest in Jerusalem certainly confirms that Paul was right to be apprehensive about his visit, but Luke himself is very silent. He's curiously silent about the collection, uh, although in Acts 24, 17, if you look back at that, he may touch upon it briefly. But other than that, there's no big deal made about it, so it's rather interesting. The final, chapters, uh, the final chapter of Romans opens with a brief letter of recommendation for, uh, as he writes, our sister Phoebe, presumably she's the bearer of the letter, and it's important for Paul that she be received with respectful hospitality by the congregations in Rome. Paul identifies her as a deacon of the church in Cancrea a harbor town about seven miles east of Corinth. The word deacon does not here yet refer to a defined office in the church's life, uh, but there is certainly some leadership role here that she has as a deacon. That's important to note. Um, and that also, uh, that point is underscored when Paul refers to her as a benefactor 
a person of means who provides concrete support for Paul's mission. You have a lengthy list of greetings in verses three through 16, uh, 24 named individuals and a number of unnamed people associated uh, with these named individuals. Paul had not yet been to Rome, but he had no doubt met many of these people while they were exiled from Rome and had taken up residence in Corinth and Ephesus, uh, as we saw with Priscilla and Aquila. It may be that he includes this lengthy list in order to secure a relationship with Rome and to gain a better understanding or a better hearing for his letter. Uh, the list includes many people who are unknown to us, uh, but they do get their names here in the letter. Uh, in Rome, as elsewhere, early Christians did not worship in special buildings dedicated for that purpose, but instead gathered in the homes of individuals. The practice is evident when Paul greets Priscilla and Aquila and the church in their house, uh, as well as when he greets those who are with them in other households. In addition, so we have to, when we think of the church at Rome, what we re really need to think are churches in Rome, a series uh, of several, how many we don't know, but of several house churches. All right. Um, there may be at least one prominent household uh, mentioned, that of Aristobulus, um, and some have suggested this is a great-grandson of Herod the Great, uh, which would be very interesting to ponder. And uh, Paul includes the names of several women, and his comments about them suggest that their significant leadership, that they have significant leadership in the house churches at Rome. So he greets Priscilla and Aquila, uh, whom he identifies, notice, as co-workers and who risk their necks on his account. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila were uh, expelled from Rome due to Claudius' decree, degree and worked with Paul in Corinth, we're told in Acts chapter 18. Uh, the husband and wife team then accompanied Paul to Ephesus and now back, are back at Rome with their own house church. Um, so uh, Priscilla is not the only woman identified as working on behalf of the gospel. Paul employs similar language of Mary, um, not Jesus's mother, but of a Mary, as well as Trophania, Tryphosa, and Persis. Uh, elsewhere, he uses the same language to refer to his own apostolic lab labor. Most revealing here, and most important here, is verse 7. He greets Andronicus and Junia, who were in prison alongside him and who are prominent among the apostles. Notice that Junia is a, is a female. He refers to her as prominent among the apostles. So she clearly has a key leadership role in the New Testament. The use of the New Testament to keep women out of leadership roles, particularly out of ministry, pastoral ministry, is a misreading of those texts. Very clearly, there were women in the early church who had leadership and had authority. All right. Um, so uh, in verses 17 through 20, Paul issues a warning to his friends that they keep an eye out for those who cause splits in the community and who smooth talk their way into a position that is contrary to that which they have previously learned. He then adds greetings from those who are with him and who may travel with him to Jerusalem, including Timothy, um, Lucius, and uh, Jason, possibly this Jason is a Thessalonian host that is mentioned in Acts 17, five through nine. And then you get uh, other persons and then the scribe Tertius, to whom Paul has dictated the letter. And so this is what we know Paul did. He had um, ed, uh, a, a, an amanuensis, as it's called, who is an editor. Uh, and Paul would have either dictated the letter or outlined concerns, and then the editor would have crafted it. In this case, it seems that Paul is dictating this letter to Tertius, who inserts himself into the letter, saying he greets uh, the Romans there. So um, that's how Romans ends. And uh, we'll begin tomorrow with uh, the first letter, Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. Let us pray, gracious God. Again, for another day, for the blessings we have received, we are thankful. And for all things that we have received from your hand, may we in turn, we in turn use it to bless others. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, friends, have a great day.